It's called the Schema.org Blueprints module. I am working on the sales pitch for this and saying it's the fastest and I have added cheapest way to build standardized content models in Drupal. Because for salespeople, that's a good thing to say, or business people to be like, this saves you money and time and makes your life easier. The introduction is, you know, who am I and what problem am I trying to solve? I, I mean, I like, I've changed to stay. I want to make your life easier by solving complex problems with simple, well thought out solutions. And to introduce schema, this is all this information I just said in JSON LD, which is schema.org's way of describing things. And that link at the bottom is the first website I ever built. And sometimes I share it, and sometimes I don't. The, the challenge that I'm trying to address is we, the Drupal community, need to create, personalize, and distribute content that is consumable by multiple channels, which include people, machines, and search engines. I definitely added that recently to my deck because I think it illustrates the breadth of what I'm after, is to write information that people understand, machines meaning AI, machine learning, and search engines. We all want good search engines to rank us up. And the approach I'm taking is exploring, implementing a next generation content management system in Drupal that's supports progressive decoupling, structured data, advanced content authoring, and omni-channel publishing. And I've kind of simplified, my feeling of Drupal at this point is Drupal's for content. And if you start there, it helps you plan out how Drupal works in your infrastructure. I am the maintainer of the web form module, and I go back and forth in saying I would recommend web forms for an enterprise client. If they have the resources to have a dedicated form server, they need to explore what the best product is for that. And they, frankly, even my organization, I'm pitching, I'm the maintainer of WebForm, but you should have that on a separate server. Or use survey, we're using SurveyJS for some other things. But if you think Drupal for content, that's, that aligns with a lot of things. It's for the back end, it's for your data, it aligns with decoupling, it's where Drupal excels. It's not necessarily a CRM, you should use a CRM. So some concepts that just, I, you know, just came from a headless presentation. But I want to emphasize this because from, pulled from Wikipedia is a headless content management system is a backend only content management system that acts primarily as a content repository. And that's like the generic definition everywhere. And every time I see people talk about headless, they omit that that has to be a content authoring and content management platform. It's probably the most important thing to distinguish a headless CMS. Like you can go where I feel like Drupal excels is it does great content authoring with a ton of flexibility. You can go to Contentful, it's good, but you don't have a lot of flexibility. You are limited to how they do things, and that's it. And you'll see where if you start leveraging stuff in Drupal, you can build amazing content authoring experience. So schema.org, who's not familiar with schema.org in the room? If everyone's familiar, I can speed up a lot faster. I can skip things. Under the assumption that you've been to the schema.org website and looked at it and said, oh, this makes sense, what they're trying to say here, here's an event. And that's what I saw years ago, and someone hinted like, everyone, I kept hearing content architects saying, yeah, I look at schema.org before I do my content models and I copy a lot from there. And that's what inspired this approach, where I'm like, why wouldn't, we're, our content architects are looking at schema.org first. And the schema.org first approach just leverages schema.org as the foundation for building your content models using structured data, which is API first, standardized, and universal. Versus what a lot of sites will do is they'll make up their own content model and then they'll cram it into schema.org spec so they get the SEO, it kind of seems like a backward approach. Um, and the Blueprints module just takes the schema.org first approach to building content models and structured data in Drupal. And I just have, as I worked in this module, just some philosophy stuff that I've kind of realized. I'm really pushing standardization. It helps maximize compatibility, interoperability, repeatability, and quality. And if we all have the same standards of how we structure our content, it makes it easier for us to share and understand it. Composition, just because some people will throw out there, there's a lot of sub-modules, but I'm a big fan of this. You've got to break things down into smaller components. It makes it easier to maintain those components, makes them more stable and easier to support. So there's, you'll see at some point there's a slide of, I'm going to hit 40 sub-modules, but the goal there is you have one little sub-module that does one little thing well, if you have a problem with it, you can go in and fix it very easily or contribute to it. Um, configuration, this is just my feeling, and you'll get overwhelmed by the amount of configuration you could do with this module, is in Drupal, everything should be configurable. That's the best way to meet people's needs, because then you eliminate them needing to write custom code. If you can say, you can change this label or this thing in the admin UI, that gives them a lot of flexibility. And 
I just feel with decoupling, automation is really important. Things are getting more and more complex, so you need to automate complex, time-consuming tasks. It just saves time, money, energy, just at least to improvements in quality. And what you're going to see is a lot about automation. Um, and I'll, I'll call it out. So I signed the deck to break it down into goals. And primary, secondary, and tertiary. In this slide, I need to adjust this slide as I'm starting to think about it, but I want to emphasize where I feel like this module fits in. It's a foundational module. It does your data structures, your back end, and then you start layering things on top of it. And I'm only calling out the ones that interest me, you know, SEO, just own LD, your APIs with JC, JSON API support, but I'm definitely exploring GraphQL. And I'm just dabbling in Next.js. I am just realizing if you're talking about decoupling, you have to kind of have some front end you're targeting just to illustrate how it could work. And so the primary goals are about structured data, APIs, and SEO. Those are the big benefits from schema.org. And I'll explain the API stuff as I, I demo it. And just secondary, because I, I brought this up, I think decoupling the backend content authoring is key. I think Dries is starting to align with that by saying site building is really important to the Drupal community or trying to improve it. So with this idea that we have this structured data, I want to make sure we can author the best data and make the best authoring experience available. And, and the third part is just really, it's Drupal, it's open source. It's important to emphasize that I'm trying to build a, an ecosystem of something that's very modular, extendable, flexible, and stable. Um, so when I talk about these goals, perfect data structure. So the, when you're building your content models in Drupal, they make sense, they're perfect. They're well-defined off an open standard to accomplish that, it's a lot about knowing the standard, building mappings from Schema.org to be like, I need to take this information from Schema.org, bring it into Drupal, and create a Drupal entity, event, would be the one. I think I'm gonna use that as the demo, and I have some other ones to go through. And once you have that standard there, you can get really great APIs, because your APIs are based on Schema. You can remove all your Drupalisms. You don't have to have field underscore first name in your JSON API. You can have, and actually it's not first name and schema because that's an American thing. I think it's given, na uh, given name, family name, and surname, and you can use that open standard to define your, your, your APIs. And SEO is just this idea, we want to have that built in. We want to just be able to describe our information to search engines and they immediately get it. Um, so I'm going to start demoing some stuff, and I'm going to slow down here because you can ask any question. I'm going to go down any rabbit hole I feel like because it's a small group. I think you'll just enjoy it. Um, so this is a clean install of Drupal using the Jin admin theme. And I'll get into the content authoring because that's a secondary thing. But I just want to kind of you want to demo a module in the best. You know, I don't want to use Olivero. I want it to be as, as clean and pretty as possible. To start, one of the first steps of building the module was getting schema.org into Drupal. So, and that's broken into a sub-module, which is just, it's a schema.org reports module. And it brings schema spec into Drupal. It imports it into a table. We have the information of the types. So if we've been on, this is exactly what's on schema.org. So you can click through. You can get the full list of every schema.org type. You can filter it. You go to event. Let's see, events right there. And I'm augmenting it a little bit. There's the very little augmentation other than adding references. Because to understand schema.org and you're like, I want to do events, it's worth Googling events and seeing what people are recommending. Because schema.org is a very vast spec. And a little note about schema.org versus Google is Google has what they call a rich search results. It's a subset of schema that Google will leverage on <coughs> search results. So you kind of want to think about both those things at the same time. I personally have a recommendation, always target schema. I have heard Google engineers talk about it, and they say, we aggregate everything that people put out there from schema on the web as long as it's valid, and then we analyze it. And if people are using a property that's interesting, we'll bring it into our rich search results. So it's worth, even if you're not going to see an immediate benefit, it's worth doing it if you have the data. Um, I have an interesting one. While I was at the VA, mm -hmm. this is being important. While I was at the VA, I worked with Google to try to get questions and answers from within the VA ecosystem to show up in search results mm -hmm. by adding the correct schema. Yeah. Um, and that was both awesome and scary because veterans may not go any further. So we decided to pull the plug. Mm -hmm. It was an interesting use case of like working with Google to try to leverage our content in a more effective way. Yeah. But it was 
very behind the scenes. I mean, the FAQ scheme is, I, that's one of the first ones I would do on a site. It is so powerful, because you immediately, if you do FAQs and you do them right, Google will, it'll appear. If you ask a question, like I work for a cancer hospital, if you say, what is breast cancer, Google will pick that up and immediately do it. And I think it starts to drive a lot of vo voices also picking up on those FAQs as well. So you get, you get a lot of reach by just having FAQs on the site. Um, so what you see here is what's on schema. At the bottom, I am including some little notes, and I want to emphasize what these are. This is highlighting. So there's a huge list of properties. But obviously for our sites, we're not going to want every single property that Schema offers for event. We're going to want some defaults, like a description, the event schedule, the status, an image, what language it's in. Um, I do list out all properties. In the module, there is an ignored property list to try to limit the information overload that you're going to get. That's completely customizable, but there's lots of properties that very few organizations are going to think about funding for an event. It just doesn't seem relevant. So I'm just trying to simplify that because you can get, there's an information overload. There are over a thousand properties defined in the schema.org spec. All right, so we have this event and we want to add an event to our site. From here, lots of ways to do this. From here, you can say, I'd like to add an event type. And now you have this form and there's another way to get to it. If you're on content types, you could say, I would like to add schema.org type. And once again, you get this browser, you can find it and I can click on event and come back to it. And what this form is, is it's like a catch-all for creating a content type in Drupal. So the first part is you're adding the content type saying, I want an event. It figures out, it takes the name from schema, it puts it into a machine-readable name. If it's a very long name, it will truncate it with an algorithm. Description is blank, so that when you're creating these things, it'll... Uh, I leave it blank because there's a module. This is like all the crazy submodules. There's a schema.org description submodule. So your descriptions for your entity and fields are blank, and when those entities and fields are rendered, it will pull the description from schema.org, so it's continually updated. Of course, if you enter a description, you can override that and customize it. But it means you don't have to think about naming things at all. You're getting all that information from schema. There's also a subtyping pattern here, um, and I'll, I'll show you what it does, is it just takes the subtypes of events and makes you you're able to create an event and then have this little drop down and say, I would like to make this a little extra more specific by saying, I'd like it to be a children's event. The reality with certain subtype patterns in schema, there's, that's the only extra piece of information. When you create a children's event, there's no extra properties. It's just that you're defining that it's a children's event. So we don't have to create content types for every single subtype. And, and the, one of the reasons this list is here is you can curate it. You can simplify it to your organization because I frankly think most people would have them one or two of these, an education event, an event series, and that may be it. If they are a children's website, they'd have children's, but they might not have comedy events. And that subtyping pattern exists in any place that there's subtypes, and sometimes I use it and sometimes I don't. Um, an example would be with organizations, I tend to not recommend subtyping because it helps to be very specific. If you're a hospital, you need a hospital content type. There's a lot of value that on your, in your architecture deck this is a hospital, not like this is an organization that is, a, there's a lot of extra properties. Also, one benefit of having individual content types in Drupal, you can do better filtering and views on it. Um, now we're getting past the content type, and I'm going to skip layout, and I'll demo what layout I'm experimenting with. But these are the default properties I just showed you. It's showing you them listed. The color coding, which I don't have a key, but it's kind of simple. If it's green, it's, it's mapping an existing field. So description gets mapped to body. If it's yellow, it's going to create a new field. I worked with Martin, oh, I can never get his last name right, um, who's the maintainer of smart date to integrate smart dates into Drupal. So there's an event schedule. Instead of having start date, end date for an event, event schedule allows you to say, here's an event, and here, it's an amazing module. Here's all the dates I think it's going to happen. It repeats on these dates, and you can curate exactly when this event's going to happen. So that's a much richer way. It's great data. Going down, very standard stuff. I do, I'll sit here for a second to emphasize how wonderful Schema is at naming things. They don't say language. They don't say line code. They say in language, because that's the right way to name a property, because you're saying this content is in a language. When you say language is an object that's describing something, and there's lots of nuances in the schema.org spec where a lot of people thought about how to name things properly. Now, from here, 
And I'll show you there's a problem here. This supports organization and performer, but it's listing it. It's going to create a plain text field. The reason is I don't have those other content types on the site. So when it's building, it's trying to figure it out, but there's none of the relationships are there yet because we haven't started building the site. So if I clicked here, I'd get an event content type, but at the top, there's this warning. Because generally, you don't create content types in isolation, you create sets of content types. And the example with event is, before you create an event, you probably want to have a place, and you want to have people and organizations, because that's what makes an event happen. So what I did is there's a concept of mapping sets. There's a mapping set module, and I'm going to click through to the UI. And I'm going to bump up a second to say, and this is all configurable, but you're basically saying, here's sets of content types and paragraphs, and I'm just using paragraphs in this example, that work together. And generally, I'm only going to focus on common, but the idea is you need a place first. That's the first content type you probably need to create on your site. Organization, person, event. And then there's some required ones. And this is an example where, for media integration, I have the media module turned on. And this is, if I go over here, Yes, we have an image on the site, but we don't have it mapped to schema.org, so we have to add a mapping to say, let's take Drupal's default image. And, and you see why it's green? Because I'm just taking existing properties on media and mapping it to schema.org, so I understand that this is an image. If I go back to the mapping set, I click set up types, and this is where automation kicks in. So I'm gonna click confirm, and then I'll open up one or two of these. This is generating an entire IA for you on the fly, automating like 30, 20 entity types with all the relationships and all the configuration forms all in one. And this will probably leave me, oh yeah, left. Um, so we have it, it's, it's like there's magic happening in the background, but to show you the content architecture, it helps to fill it. So I'm gonna generate the content types. I am gonna spend a second here, because I love this. Okay, so this is the web page. Entity type and schema map to page in Drupal, and it actually adds three amazing properties that I think are just brilliantly thought out. Primary image of the page, not image, primary image of the page. That's what you want on a web page. You want to define exactly what the key image is. That lends itself to you can take that information and send it to Twitter, or Facebook, you can put in your meta tags. It's a little extra level of specificity. And even when they did linking, they were smart enough to split related links and significant links. And to me, significant links, if you had a blog post, for example, I work for a hospital about cancer type, a significant link would be a direct link to the additional cancer information and maybe the doctor doing the research. Related links are related news articles. And by splitting that information off, one, it gives search engines a little extra information. If you're doing personalization, I would lean toward personalizing related links and never personalizing significant links to split those two up. It's almost like saying some links are sticky or more important than the other. So, I'm going to fill this up. I'm getting this error because I'm doing Devel Generate's not perfect. Um, the other part is it just created a bunch of content types. It actually even started filling in the XML sitemap. So when these, it's saying this is the content. And now I'm going to start showing you some content. Okay. So I'm going to stick to it. So what it did is it generated an event content type for us. It built the, note, the view display, the field group module is installed, so it started grouping those fields together. So it's doing all this automation. I do want to emphasize, you seeing all this? Everything here is Drupal. You can configure it as much as you want. If you don't want field groups, don't turn them on. If you want to augment them, there's hooks to augment them to do all. You could have it build tabs if you wanted that architecture. And sticking to the primary goal, so we've created a perfect data structure. Now at the bottom, there's these slide outs where we get our SEO, our JSON LD. So this is a perfect description. This is a music event mapping to JSON LD. And it's getting all the sub-properties, the image. This is event schedule. So this is that great where that, by the way, if you have multiple repeating dates, it'll just list them out so that a search engine will know exactly what's going on with your event. Location, it maps to a place. It pulls in all that data. And there's a little tr trick here, the validator. I'm not going to go there, but you can copy this and cut and paste it into schema.org validator. I wish that was an API, but they have not offered that yet, so you have to kind of do that manual step. At the same time, I validated this and it worked as expected. Similarly, going back to the third one, APIs, or the second one I had on the list, 
is this is just JSON API, and there's a schema.org JSON API module, and what it does is when your entity types are being created, it creates JSON APIs for that entity type with some filtering of getting out the Drupalisms. It uses the JSON API extra module to change the names so you're not exposing. By the way, in, in the background, I am not using field underscore for uh, like given name. I'm using schema underscore to distinguish in the field system what schema data, what's like field arbitrary Drupal data. That decision I'm going back and forth on. You can change that prefix. That's kind of a nice feature that people don't know about. But in JSON API, we're just getting some standard Drupal fields, not all of them. I actually, there's a filter to when you're setting up those endpoints to take out like revision date, which very few people care about. Um, but then you get description instead of body, event schedule, it doesn't have any under, you know, field underscore event schedule. The API documentation is then generated based off the schema.org spec, so you have descriptions for all of these properties in your JSON API. Um, Okay, any questions on every, anything I showed you? Because I'm going to switch gears to content author. Okay. So, yep, I covered most of it. For content authoring, you see I'm going after something. I am like, if we're going to do these APIs, we're going to build this great data, we have to have a great authoring experience and try to push Drupal. So how do you push Drupal? Take the best in class of modules in Drupal and get them working together. And when you're creating, when you click create, a content type to pull those in. So that's why you, I'll show you there's a bunch of submodules. The idea is to bring in smart date. If you install smart date, you're going to get smart dates. If you install, there's an office hours module. It adds an office hours field so you can say exactly Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, when do you open, close this rich data. If you have that module installed and you build a location, you can put the opening hours perfectly in there. Um, the big picture, I use Gen Admin theme. I recommend it for everyone. I've had a huge amount, like, I, we're not using it on my active project, and I'm like kind of bummed because my experience is it's perfect. And the, I've watched how it's evolved, and it just gets better and better and cleaner and cleaner. In terms of authoring, I'm just pulling in the best practices. So the list I have is, you know, multimedia in Drupal, but then you want to make, you know, that's built into core, but then you want to do embedded content is helpful. Content browsing, inline entity forms can help a lot with user experience. I'm just playing with a lot of things. Like everyone uses focal points. So what's nice is when you create any image in the system and you have the schema.org focal point model, mod, module turned on, it'll just add focal point to that field. So you don't have to sit there configuring every single field. And you can tweak that setting as you're going along. Um, and with progressive decoupling, I'm just playing with Next.js. And I'll, I have to say it's playing. Here's all the modules so far. It's massive. The idea is, I know, it's, <laughs> you're laughing because it's, well, the, there's a couple of things I'll state. Like, I know it go, it's an anti-pattern to what people are used to. And, like, they're not used to someone saying, I'm going to go crazy with modules. There's no downside to having all these modules. What I see as a benefit is you get very isolated pieces of functionality. And I've moved every integration into a module, which helps me sort out the APIs. Because what happened, what, like even with, um, I had taxonomy deep and buried in all this code in the core module. I was like, let's move it out just in case someone doesn't want to use taxonomy. And that forced me to get the APIs in order to allow that integration to work. Um, and then the other part is you can get great test coverage because you can have an individual module with everything tested. And someone needs to go in and they're concerned about field groups, they can go fix it right there. Um, and what that does is it creates all this feature set that you're seeing here. I do want to spend one second here. These are the base modules. These are the key things. Like when I was showing you a lot of the cool stuff before, it's these like six or seven modules that are key. Even the UI is something you could turn on and off, but you want to, I strongly recommend turning on most of the modules and understanding what they're doing. Um, okay. So those are the features. A lot of stuff you're seeing here, I'm just pulling from distributions. What's the best practices in the Drupal community? I looked at I have a list at the end, but looking at what Acquia is doing and recommending for content authoring, what they're experimenting with. Um, I think recipes is an interesting one. When I, I'm not sure how this will fit into recipes. I just want to call that out. Like dis Distributions are definitely moving toward recipes, like a small set of configuration with a few module recommendations instead of a giant bundle of modules. Um, yeah, and I, I align with what Teresa is saying. We need to create ideal user experiences for ambitious site builders. We really need to focus on that now. So with the content authoring, 
We're on our event content type. And when what I want to emphasize is we clicked that button and it did a lot of configuration for us out of the box. So this isn't out of the box, but basically I set up good, there's a schema.org demo module where I'm just experimenting with this where it just supports, you know, common practices. You know, we know about images. You can just insert an image. This is core. Just want to emphasize media library, just working as expected. But in the demo, I installed the, I forget the name of it, the, the drag and drop library, which uh, drop zone is the one, just to improve the user experience and see how this works and get feedback on it. Uh, but I am doing an embed pattern, and I wanted to do embed because I actually like this pattern where you can embed an article inside another piece of content, and it embeds it, and it just puts a little XML tag, and the schema.org blueprints embed module picks this up and actually generates the own LD properly. It says, oh, you've embedded another piece of content. Let me add that to the JSON LD as a reference. Um, moving forward, just the idea that, like, this is smart date. I think smart date is absolutely amazing. You can go in and say, I have this event. It repeats on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. Once you generate that list, you can go and adjust all the dates. Um, by the way, this is the descriptions. It's pulling in from schema.org automatically. This is just, it goes out to their CSV file and adds the descriptions, and I have translations working for it, so if the community translate it, translates it, it'll work. I'm just trying to get the patterns perfect here, like everything has entity browser. Well, this is inline editing, this is the browser. Oh. Oh, I'm experimenting with little helpful modules that don't let you lose your data, because <laughs> I think it makes a huge difference to be exploring those things and to test them. Um, no, yeah, this just decided not to work, but... Ooh, there we go. Um, even with taxonomy, there's a schema.org taxonomy module. I do a lot of personalization stuff, and the concept we're working with is we want to add tags to every single piece of content on the site when it's created. So what that module does is when new content types are created, it adds tags to the bottom of the content type and configures... This is called the Entity Reference Tree Widget, which is probably the best way to handle large taxonomies. It gives you this really, and these are all optional. That's why there's so many modules, because it's you can pick and choose what works for you, and you can turn it off. Um, in the sidebar, I'm doing little things. I This is a pet peeve thing that I did. It adds meta tags to every single content type. If you, what, What's very powerful about that is there's a schema.org meta tag module. By default, it adds it to all nodes, but you can say exactly which content type should have meta tags, so when you're setting up a site, you could be like, I want meta tags on events, I don't want them on this type. And then I added a little extra code just to simplify the list. I mean, it's, I personally find meta tags to be a fire hose of information. I think just having four fields is more than enough. Simple XML sitemap, same thing. Just as you're creating those content types, it just adds them to the XML sitemap. So you don't have to sit there figuring out all these different relationships. And then there's this very experimental thing where this is not schema. This is just editorial information, but this idea that as you're building a site, you're going to have other layers. So the point is, like, schema is just your data, but editorial wants to be able to track little pieces of information about their content. So this is just an experimental module where I have a paragraph that stores all the editorial information, and when you're adding content types to the site, it just tucks it in the bottom right-hand corner. Um, it's really specific for my client. It might get moved out. Um, okay, so I'm going to go back. Any questions on authoring before I keep going? Okay. I'm going to see that I didn't, let's see. Okay, let's see if Next works as expected. It does work. So this is the Next.js module installed. Um, it allows us to get a preview of this content in a Next.js site. It's just a little sandbox. I'm using the Next.js starter kit and just augmented it a little bit. Um, it, it's meant to just give people a starting place to then build out their decoupled front end. For example, I didn't set up event schedules, so I'm just dumping the data, and the front end team would have to work with it. But what I am experimenting with, with automation, is the, the fact that in Drupal you have a content type with a display mode, you can use it to generate a Next.js component. So what I'm doing here is generating a React component. It's just like a template. It's an experiment of, can we make it easier for front end devs to build out the headless front end. And on the back end, I know they will need a React, React component. And it's just going in and setting up some very simple stuff. So if there's a description, 
it render it gives them the little snippet for description. There's a drush command. So what you're seeing on this site, if I browse around, there's a drush command where I run it and it takes every single entity type and just spits out React components into a directory. And it's just a starting place. Very this is all actually isolated into its own module because I don't ever really see this going live. Um, I have heard of other people doing this with headless. They're thinking about it because it's really hard to rebuild an entire front end. Drupal has a lot of presentation logic there. Um, yep, and that's the, the, the actual uh, React component that it's generating. Okay. Uh, oh, layout. That's the one I'm actually ridiculous. I'm, I am proud of layout. I'm going to sit here and just say. It, it's. Because um, when we were talking about going headless, everyone gets really concerned. How do you do rich layout? What's the right approach in Drupal? So I wanted to explore it. I've settled on Paragraph's layout module. I think it's a pretty spectacular solution. Um, and so there's a sub-module for that. And what it does is I'm going to just build a home page. And maybe we'll call it an about page. Um, so by the way, you're seeing those nice fields, primary image of the page, related links. And at the bottom, it allows you to add some layout. And what I, I'm just experimenting where this paragraphs layout, the schema.org paragraphs layout module sets up some components that actually map to schema.org. I don't know anyone else who's doing this. So when I say I want a call to action, uh, when I say, I don't know, this is a call to action, I'm gonna add a piece of media. Uh, oh, I can add the logo from the module. Logo, here, I can show you the module page. Just use this. Here. We're building a little CTA, adding the logo. There we go. Some text, some links. Here, we'll use this. There are more. Um, one of the reasons I did this was to experiment with some extra stuff that they had. So, by the way, this is just, I think it's called the paragraphs behaviors module or styles, I'd have to look it up, but I'm just augmenting this link and making it a button. I might give it a title, but this is schema stuff underneath it. So schema has a specification they call action. Action is kind of extra information about a page that what's the action you want a user to take. So they're on this home page and I, I don't think I want them to view, I would like them to read. But you can have a search action or a call out. So you're adding this rich, inf you're building a page with call outs and those calls are actually understandable by search engines. They understand what you're expecting you to, to do with it. Uh, I'm going to hit save. So we get our nice, oh, and I missed a behavior here that I actually like. You can go in and augment this and say, I'd like to make this a little prettier. And since we are, it's not layouts unless you have two columns. You do two columns, but I want to illustrate more experimentation with schemas here. I'd like to put a quote. Let me pull one. Let's see. We'll just do this. Quote. Cool. I'm adding a quote. I'm going to say the author is the URL. The creator. Let's put it in. That's actually legitimate schema. I'm adding that. And here, I'll put this as another quote. I'm going to fix that too. You know what, I'm, not, I'm gonna put it in as a statement, because by the way, uh, schemas distinguishes between statements and quotes. A statement would just be like, we're the greatest thing on earth. A quote is quote, um, and schema supports that. So as I'm doing layout here, that actually has meaning. And at the bottom, I'm gonna wanna put a video, and I'm gonna add media. I'm gonna pull my little video from here. I think it will actually work the way I want. By the way, I'm also just showing off how awesome media is in Drupal. <laughs> just one, I, like, I'm very impressed by how well this works. Okay. Has anyone, is everyone familiar with the Paragraphs layout module, or should I spend time saying how cool it is? <laughs> All right, I'll spend a little more time to say, I'm going to, I'm going to just call out the most important feature it has. So I'm going to save it, and I've got layout. Now, when I say layout, is let's close this so we don't have a let you know like I didn't build this part out but one of the reasons I went with this approach is you can collapse it go to the bottom and then we go down to just zone LD 
And what we're getting is those individual components are being understood by search engines. So they do not have a CTA component yet in schema. It's something they're talking about, but a web page is, they're, what they're realizing is they set up web page and website and they realize they needed to maybe do a high level thing called web component that just describes a piece of information on the page. And they're still working out that spec, but for now, the CTA is just a web page, but we're giving it some meaning. There's the name, there's the text, there's the image object, but then you see really rich data. Schema understands what a quote is. Google now knows you have a quote on your homepage, or you've made a statement about your business. Um, and then that last piece is that action. This is the action parameter. So every single piece of content in Schema can have a potential action. What do you expect someone to do with it? Um, to finalize how much I love layout, Paragraphs layout, they have rich WYSIWYG editing, but the best part is they have accessibility worked out perfectly. So you can click on something and move it around. You can move, hit escape. All of these details are worked out really well. So editing directly on your website. So what you see is what you get. Um, okay, I'm gonna wrap this up. <laughs> Hey, listen, this is Drupal, it's open source. We want to leverage the best in class open source tools. This you know, is inspired by popular distributions. The modules on drupal.org, schema.org is the namespace. Um, the goal is to build modular and extendable code. That's really, if you look at the APIs, that's what it's after. Um, and to make things as stable and testable as possible. There's a ton of test coverage, because I just made that my mission. So basically everything's a service with an interface and every test walks through the interface and confirms that things are going to work. That's geeking out but worth stating. Let's get back to the big picture. Benefits. What is good about this? Well, standardization, simplification, acceleration. Using schema.org, it just makes things easier to understand, less thinking. Leveraging schema.org, an open established, an open and established standard, makes it easier for organizations to create a content information architecture is simple for API consumers and search engines to understand. Everyone gets this. Um, it's simpler to build. You, you, you're having a standardized content information architecture. Removes the challenge of naming things. You don't have to sit there debating how to build a person. It's first name, well, it's given name, family name, surname, um, and even your relationships. It scheme is giving you recommendations, and they've sorted out a lot of those details. This all leads to acceleration. It is just. I just generate, I want to emphasize, I generate an entire information architecture in a click that's completely customizable. So for a large enterprise, the pattern would be, and those are Drush commands. I want to emphasize what I did in the UI, you can have a Drush command for. You could have a server building, show your team the content architecture, say, what's wrong with it? And they say, okay, go change these properties. I want to add these properties. You go adjust your configuration, you export it, you rerun the setup command. You, you could tear it down. And set up. So you could build a content architecture in two weeks for a pretty big site, as long as you know what you want to do. If you're like, we're a hospital, this is the content types, this is what we're after, you can get there. And also you can keep adding to it, because literally you saw there's a UI where you can go back to an event and be like, well, we missed this property, let's add it in. Um, and yeah, the number one goal of this module is to empower organizations to reach their goals by making it easier, simpler, and faster to author, maintain, and share content. And just some conclusions. I mean, this saves time and resources. It saves you money. If you're building a content architecture, you can have something that'll last forever. It's quicker to build. Um, my personal conclusion, Schema.org makes an excellent standardized foundation for a next generation Drupal website or application. I just really enjoyed exploring Drupal's content authoring and pushing it, like pulling in all the best practices, because it just shows you how robust it is and flexible. It's kind of where Drupal is going to stand out, I think. Layout paragraphs is awesome. I think JSON LD is key for SEO. Um, a statement about JSON LD is I predict that it will trump metadata in the next 10 years. There's no reason to have meta tags if you have JSON LD. It, it, why would Twitter want their own custom meta tags when you just described what the primary image of the page is? It doesn't, it's going to stop making sense to have all those meta tags. They, they should bring those in. If they need a piece of information that's missing from a web page, they should bring it into um, Schema. Uh, I really like JSON API, it's very clean. I am starting to see GraphQL as another really important approach to this. Um, I'm starting to feel Next.js is becoming the de facto in Drupal. Um, a lot of people are buying into it heavily. 
I can say that Acquia has definitely said we're going with Next.js for decoupling. They have their own starter kit. Um, decoupling adds a lot of complexity, and I think it can be mitigated by improving a team's tooling and overall approach. I mean, this literally takes a lot of back-end stuff out of the way. You can just have a back-end, and then your front-end teams can, they know what they're going to get. Um, some appendix, just listen, there's a ton of documentation. I, I mean, I'm going to, on the project page, I'm still fleshing it out, but I am, like, every single module is actually documented. It's in a markdown file, but this will take a second to generate. But, yeah, it's, it's, it's every single sub-module has its own readme file with documentation, what's the intent. Um, the roadmap is, is, I'm trying to flesh it out. I am going to do an installation guide. Because there's just a lot of, you see, there's a lot of modules. You have to explain what's going on and what you need to do. Um, I've been writing about this for a very long time. So there's spot quests going back at least two years. And Can I keep you go writing. Back one slide? Yeah. What was that checklist? Uh, that's really, I read a great book, like The Checklist Manifesto. Good yeah. question. Um, and it just made me, like, I actually pulled it out, but I have a way to get back to it. Let me see. Did I pull it out? I don't think I did. I pulled it off the... Oh. I was just experimenting with... How do you explain to someone you use this? What are the roles? What's the checklist for people understanding it? And I, I'm not sure I'm going to keep this at all. But it's like... You, you have to define... Yeah, role-based checklist. Architect, site builder. They're building the entity edit points, the entity references, the workflows, the moderation, content editors going through it. I, I, it's just experimental stuff. But it's a great book, by the way. Checklist Manifesto is just about how to organize your day-to-day -day things and break it down to smaller tasks. Um, yeah, I'm just listing the CMSs that I'm looking at. I, I'll, I'll throw out there that I think Aqua CMS has really turned a corner where um, it stopped becoming a distribution and did become a starter kit in the last of the 2.0 release. So when you install it, it's little, you can decide which pieces of Aquia, which pieces of Drupal you want to use and which pieces of Aquia. If you don't want to use, you could use it and have no Aquia code in there. You can just be like, we want to um, do events and you can set up an event system with it. Um, these are features that I have to explore and think about. I, I am try, I'm trying to figure out GraphQL. It would be ideal if this could generate a, a default graph for someone that's based on schema, but I haven't really wrapped my head around how to do that. I, my problem is GraphQL is really complex. It is. Like, and there's a GraphQL Compose module that's starting to do some, like going in that direction, but then I feel like they made a decision not to automatically generate graphs because you're supposed to do it from scratch. Yeah, the, the demo for GraphQL makes it seem like, ah, you just like send these data to you, and it works great. And yeah. you dig into how to do that, you're like, oh my god. Yeah. Sim so simplicity is not so simple. I, <laughs> that was my takeaway when I started deploying GraphQL. I'm like, this is great. I want to consume this. I don't want to generate this. This is messy. <laughs> it's messy, but it's worth, I think, oh, yeah. I, I'm like pretty sure it's worth the investment, or you do it. I, my, my recommendation, I just wrote a post on it. My recommendation is kind of leaning in. If your team is very Drupal focused and you're decoupling, like your front end team doesn't mind Drupal, use JSON API because it'll have some Drupalisms, but it'll be faster. But then you should have a GraphQL endpoint for any data you're going to distribute. I would not distribute JSON API to outside vendors. It seems like a bad idea. Like I work with a hospital, the doctor list should be GraphQL with like perfectly decided deliberate fields you put it out there they use it if you need other data you add it on you just slow and then over 10 years you're going to have your entire information architecture in a perfect graph and that's a much more obtainable goal i i i'm totally overwhelmed by taking you know 40 <laughs> content types and putting a graph out there because you, you own it you make a mistake you can't it, you technically shouldn't change it um so where are we at with time? I'm happy if we end early. Your, your time. Oh, wow. So, Well, I obviously we can go over any questions, or you can just reach out to me. Okay. Let's I enjoy. Q&A was threaded throughout. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thanks, guys.